let's get started. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the rollout of NIGMS Sandbox, a cloud-based learning platform. Um, <clears throat> I am Ming Lei from NIGMS. I will be your host today. Uh, I actually am your uh, on-screen host, and we have quite a few uh, real hosts behind the screen. So let me share our agenda. <clears throat> so we have a packed agenda today. Um, use presenters view. We'll start off with opening remarks by uh, two NIH leaders, uh, then uh, follow up by two uh, presentations by NIH staff. Then we'll have the investigators who developed uh, two of the modules to give you uh, live demos that will provide um, a peak view of what the uh, sandbox offers. And then we will have a Q&A session at the end. Um, you should, if you have a question, you should type in the uh, Q&A box. And as a host, I will direct your question to the appropriate panelist to answer uh, on screen. Um, the webinar will be recorded. The recording of the webinar, along with the slides that are used today, will be posted on NIGMS uh, website uh, afterward. So with that, let me turn to Dr. Lorsch, who is the director of NIGMS to provide an opening remark. Oh, thank you, Ming. Uh, just very briefly want to welcome everyone and thank you for attending and say how excited we are to have this project uh, come to fruition. It's been going on for several years. It's part of our efforts to um, enable the use of cloud computing by the biomedical research community. One of the reasons we are so interested in uh, experimenting with this is that we view cloud computing is a sort of great equalizer or democratizer of um, data science um, within the community. Obviously, NIH, um, even the federal government, doesn't have the resources to provide a high-performance computer system and staff to run it and maintain it at every institution in the country that would like to engage in uh, cutting-edge data science. But cloud uh, computing uh, opens the possibility for any faculty member, staff member, or student, no matter where they are in the country, if they're at an institution that has an internet connection, um, to conduct uh, high performance um, computing based data science, uh, including things like artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, work um, from wherever they are. And I think that's really quite exciting that it opens up uh, such possibilities and levels the playing field in that way. And so this project is is one of the things that we've been doing uh, to try to experiment with that and to try to further enable that. I just want to thank uh, Ming and his team. You'll meet some of them uh, for all the hard work they've done. I want to uh, thank uh, the team at CIT and Strides, uh, Nick Weber and colleagues. I see Evors here, um, others. Uh, for the great work they've done. Uh, and of course, Susan Gregorick and her team at the Office of Data Science Strategy. Uh, they've all been tremendous partners, along with uh, Google and the folks at Deloitte who worked extremely hard on this. And uh, I think it was a really very productive engagement, as you'll see. So I'll turn it over to Susan. Thank you so much, John. Well, today is a super exciting day for me personally. Not only is this my birthday today, but also, we are officially launching the NIGMS Sandbox, a cloud-based learning platform, as you've heard. Cloud-based infrastructure touches our everyday lives, from ordering products from Amazon, which we've probably all done, to plotting tra our travel on Google Maps, to interacting with our healthcare providers through, for example, my portal health apps that most of us are probably using. Cloud-based infrastructure for research offers new opportunities, as John has said, to leverage massive amounts of computer resources at your fingertips, and you don't have to fund the entire and, quite frankly, quite expensive computational infrastructure at your own institute. 
Today, NIH has made available over 200 petabytes of data on three cloud service providers, on Google, on AWS, and on Microsoft Azure. And this is through our program. It's got this really long name, Science and Technology Research Infrastructure for Discovery, Experimentation, and Sustainability Strides. It's our Strides Initiative. And just as a note, so 200 petabytes, one petabyte is about 240,000 high quality DVD movies. So that's an awful lot of data on the three clouds. What are people doing with this? Researchers are using strides in their research. Just, I'll give you one concrete example, but there's a lot of them. For example, to understand the relationship between transposon activity and a marker for the onset of cancer mm -hmm. in a number of different cancers. So what this requires is a large multiomic study of DNA, RNA expression and protein data across multiple tissue samples. You have to look at both healthy tissues as well as cancerous tissues and look for the expression of, this is line one, um, the retrotransposon expression of, of line one is actually an indication that there could be cancer. This work is, a, a, is made possible because researchers are gathering data across multiple resources and performing petabyte analysis in the cloud. So this is just one example of what is going on now with our researchers using strides. We hope that you will be able to also benefit from this. Our goal here is to speed access to and enable research opportunities on cloud infrastructures that are de developed and facilitated by strides. And this is a partnership between ODSS, the Office of Data Science Strategy, and NIGMS to develop a cloud-based learning platform, um, the Sandbox, to enable this. We know that working on the cloud is not an uh, easy uh, element for all researchers. And so the Sandbox, as you're going to hear, is a way to experiment and try out different ways to work on the cloud before you commit time, money, and resources and people to this. So this is our Sandbox. I'm really pleased to see the outcome of this longstanding partnership. And I'm also really pleased and, and excited to hear about the 12 learning modules that were developed by NIGMS supported investigators. And I personally look forward to learning from you at, on ways that we at NIH can improve and support your research and your capabilities to leverage just for example, industry uh, capabilities such as the cloud. And I do wanna personally thank my colleagues at NIGMS, Ming Li, Lakshmi, I'm gonna butcher your last name, I'm so sorry, Mata, Matu Kumalari, and from CIT, Ivor D'Souza, who's on, as well as Nick Weber, and, and just the entire STRIDES team. From my office, Feng Lao Mao has been working on this closely with NIGMS, and of course, a huge thanks to our colleagues at Google and Deloitte. And thank you, John, personally, for your leadership and your longstanding partnership. Today, I wish everyone on the call a great success in this launch, and, and I just look forward to hearing all the ways in which we can improve Cloud Lab for your research. And with that, I'm turning back over to you, Ming. Thank you so much, Susan. So I will give, as promised, I will give you an overview of the sandbox. Let me start my slides. <clears throat> All right. So you can see my slide, right? So um, I'll provide you an overview of the NIGMS sandbox. Uh, which is a step toward democratizing cloud computing for biomedical research. Uh, John and uh, uh, Susan pretty much captured the reason or the rationales for our effort, but I'll just retouch up on a, a couple of points. That is, the biomedical research is becoming increasingly data driven. And this um, change, or you can say trend, creates needs for access to big data and data analytic capacity. But on the other hand, it also presents opportunities for uh, investigators and the students, especially those with limited research resource to broaden their participation in cutting edge biomedical research. Cloud computing may be the game changer that breaks the a barrier of uh, uh, investing uh, uh, high performing computing uh, facilities in every institution and uh, to provide this broad uh, uh, access. We at NIH, especially in NIGMS, strives to facilitate the democratization of cloud computing so that investigators and students at under resourced institutions 
can participate in cutting edge research as their peers in other institutions. <clears throat> so as a step uh, of this bigger effort, we started this collaboration or project in the beginning of 2021. As Susan and John mentioned, this really is a teamwork of a collaboration of many individuals and organizations, including NIGMS, ODSS, Google Industrial Leaders, Google, Amazon, and Deloitte, and most importantly, the GM-funded IDEA Embry and Training Program uh, investigators. We have engaged uh, three sets of activities. One, the first one is to provide training on cloud computing fundamentals to investigators and students by uh, Google and the Amazon engineers. Um, their support, generous support, I should say, helped train 500 investigators and students from our funded programs through 66 hours six hour sessions. The second effort is to migrate the, da the data operation of NIGMS funded proteomics center, service center uh, from the a local mainframe server to the cloud. And this migration uh, led to a 34, 30 fold increase in their service capacity. And the third one, which is the focus of today's webinar, is the uh, NIGMS, NIGMS Sandbox. So what is the uh, Sandbox? Uh, we envision that a Sandbox really is a collection of learning tools sitting in the, sand, sitting in the cloud that many uh, students and investi investigators alike can assess some, uh, at the same time at their own pace. We try to uh, uh, reach the following objectives. One is to provide a learning environment for users to learn how to navigate the cloud. As Susan mentioned, most of us are biomedical researchers. It takes an effort to learn how to operate in the cloud. Second really is a collection of modules, each cover a useful uh, uh, updated technology or biomedical research method for the users. And they should be interactive and enable users self-learning and in their uh, on their own pace. And finally, we want to make this affordable to a large number of users. To figure out how to achieve those goals, we started with a pair of pilot projects we first invited two investigator teams that are founded by NIGMS. Uh, they, have been, they had been working on uh, genomics and the proteomics instructions uh, respectively. So they brought in their curricula uh, to this effort. Then they are paired with uh, engineers from uh, Google and Deloitte and uh, together they converted their curricula into cloud-based workflows. Then they added instruction videos, interactive demos, and the practicum, and that let uh, uh, yield two uh, pilot modules. And along the way, those biomedical uh, investigators also picked up programming skills from the engineers that will enable them to uh, develop additional learning tools in the future. So with this uh, success of the pilot, we decided to uh, scale up and we founded 10 investigator, uh, 10 more investigator teams, each to develop one module uh, uh, following the footsteps of our pilots. So together, um, this is the uh, sandbox, the first version of the sandbox. So while right now is 12 from this diagram, I, I think you can see it really is a, a open system so that in the future, uh, investigators can build additional uh, sand, uh, modules to uh, uh, grow this sandbox so that allow 
uh, more users to, to use them on uh, more topics. So these are the um, current 12 modules. You can see they're ranging from the fundamentals of, of bioinformatics, uh, genomics, proteomics, multiomics, uh, image analysis, biomarker discovery, and uh, um, metagenomics, so on and so forth. And uh, these modules currently are sitting in the cloud in a GitHub a depository. This is, as I mentioned, our first version of Sandbox. <clears throat> and this Sandbox, as of today, can be accessed by anybody with a Google Cloud account at the following link. The usage of the Sandbox is free, except for the cost of cloud computing time, which will be paid to Google, who provide the service. At NIH, we are currently working hard to make the Sandbox also a deployable uh, through the AWS and the Azure platform. So going forward, we'll be platform neutral. To um, make the access and the use of the Sandbox to our investigators, in another word, the investigator and students founded by NIGMS, even easier or com and completely free, we took advantage of the NIH Cloud Lab, that, which is a platform that can deploy full range of different resources, can provide on-demand training, and provide account management capacity. And as the diagram shows, the NIH Cloud Lab really can uh, deploy resources uh, through both through GCP, Azure, as well as AWS. So with that, um, we are delivering this um, sandbox to our GM, GMS-funded uh, programs uh, in the following uh, way. This is an illustration, and you're going to hear uh, more specifics in the next presentation. So first, as you can see, the NIH, uh, the NIGMS funded awards or programs will identify students, faculties, and staff from their programs as the users. And they will send the uh, uh, request, access request to NIH, to NIH Cloud Lab. And NIH Cloud Lab will assign a user account to each of these authenticated users. And uh, the users can fetch the modules from uh, GM, NIGMS Sandbox and the play or learn in NI, uh, through the uh, NIH Cloud Lab. And the NIH Cloud Lab will track or clock the uh, cloud computing time used and NIH will pay the cost. So uh, before I turn in the podium to the next presenter, I just want to thank all contributors to this large collaboration, and there are 90 of them on this slide. Um, they are from NIH, from Google, um, from Deloitte, from uh, NIGMS-funded uh, uh, programs, include NIH leaders, staff, engineers, and uh, investigators, postdocs, graduate student and uh, undergraduate student. And I apologize that I cannot read all your names, but you know that we are really grateful to your effort and contribution. Thank you very much. So with that, I will turn to Lakshmi and the thought to give you um, more specifics on how to access and utilize uh, the sandbox. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lakshmi Mathmali. I'm a program director in the uh, Division of Research Capacity Building at NIGMS. It's a great pleasure working with my many NIH colleagues from CIT and ODSS, researchers from several universities, Google and Deloitte for the past two years 
in facilitating the development of these modules. These modules will be a great resource for learning, and I hope you know uh, students can become an expert in biomedical research data analysis through these modules. I am joined by Tad Carlson. He's a cloud engineer from CIT, and he will be uh, talking about uh, how to access the cloud credits. First, I will describe how you can use NIGMS sandbox modules for your cloud-based learning. Next, Tad will talk about the cloud credits offered by the, to the NIGMS awardees. So here, for using the sandbox, we'll cover the following topics. So where is the sandbox located? How you can access it? And how you can start your learning journey? So first, as Ming mentioned, the, uh, the sandbox modules are located in the GitHub repository. So there is a, the website link is provided here. And we have 12 modules uh, within the, uh, within this sandbox. And each module is comprised of an introductory video, readme notes that contains a brief introduction of the topic of research, how to install the, the module and how to execute the module. What are the, the it, it is usually uses the Jupyter notebooks. So all those Jupyter notebooks provided along with this module have extensive comments. And they also include a lot of graphs, visualizations, and also interactive quizzes. So you will see in the demos, like you know, what I'm talking about that will come later on. So for maximizing your learning and to execute these modules, you will require a Google Cloud account. So you can bring your own account. So that could be sponsored through your institution, or you can have your, your personal account for running these modules. So just to mention that like the, the Google uh, also provides like if you're a first time user, they provide free credits. So you can uh, learn about the, the free credits. So for this purpose uh, here, so we are also sponsoring uh, a few NIH sponsored institutions to be eligible for a prepaid credits for a fixed amount of time. So again, the details will be described by Thad in the next presentation. So now, uh, if uh, you are new to the Google Cloud, so we have provided extensive tutorials to help you with your learning journey. So this, there is a, a website here about uh, the, the Google Cloud GitHub repository. It's also a GitHub repository. So it has extensive notes on uh, using the, the Google Cloud, what are the uh, various tools and how to use that. So it, it makes it very easy if you are a first time user. Next, uh, if you want to, again, use the sandbox modules, the first time, we, the first thing we recommend is to browse the modules. So these modules are uh, designed in such a way that they have progressively, uh, they will increase in complexity. So you know, some of the first modules you will learn. So you will learn the basics. And as you go along, it will take you along to the learning journey and it, it will help you, uh, you know, again, become an expert on, on several advanced topics. So it is a uh, very useful tutorial. So, but as I already described earlier, it contains uh, the instructions about like, you know, uh, how, what's the computational, uh, power that you need for running the module and what language it's, it's, uh, it uses. So for example, some modules uses R and some use Python and some of them need uh, fewer uh, uh, processors and some of them need additional processors. So you can, you can learn all that uh, from the readme guide. So once you understand the, the requirements of that, uh, of running the module. So next you learn, you log into the Google Cloud module uh, interface, and then you have to uh, use the Vertex AI to select the language and also the computational resources that are specified in the module. So then you will be, you are now ready with your computer to be able to access the module. The next thing you will do is fetch the module into your local cloud account. 
So basically, uh, there are uh, you you can go into the uh, notebook and then you can ask for like you know clone the the pro, uh, it, it use the word the command clone to fetch the module into your cloud account or the cloud lab project. So next, once you you have the the module in your account, so now you are ready to launch the module and start learning. So in the next demo section, so here uh, we're going to, to see how uh, you are going to learn from two of the, the modules. So here, what I have described you is to help you with the initial launching of the modules through the uh, Cloud Lab. So now I'm going to hand it over to, so, so one more additional resource here, as I uh, described you earlier, it also has uh, introductory YouTube videos. So you can, uh, browse through those videos and also learn uh, that like this is additional layer of learning that it, this, these modules has. So again, as I told you, this is a, uh, a, a, uh, a full package of learning so that like, you know, you can do your learning by yourself. So, uh, so with that, I'm going to tap, pass it over to Tad. Watch me. And if you can just continue to uh, share the scre uh, screens, that would be great. Yeah, sure. And I apologize. I think a squirrel or rabbit uh, walked in my backyard. So my dog may be uh, <laughs> making some noises in the background. <laughs> um, but so I just want to follow on from what Lakshmi said, is that basically we built these learning tutorials in GitHub and they're publicly available. So they're, they're basically globally available for anyone with a Google account. Um, you know, so if yeah, it's a personal account or if it's a, you have one through work or through your institution or anything like that. Um, you can access these immediately. Um, but one of the things that we're providing with that is uh, a tool that we have at NIH called Cloud Lab. And this was a tool that we initially made avail available for internal uh, researchers. And that's what we've been working with over you know, the last two years um, and really finding out you know, that this is a very helpful tool for both people to uh, like learn the, the cloud because it's very important to get hands-on experience. You really don't understand the cloud until you st really start working and coding in it and starting to use the resources. And then we've also seen just a, a real success in people building pilots and prototypes. So really proving out concepts um, before they scale up for a real uh, research um, or grant or getting an award based on, on what they want to accomplish with, with that those workflows. Um, so Lakshmi, can you go to the next screen? So basically, we're making these available ex extramurally for external researchers, um, kind of leveraging what we've learned for our internal researchers. And our first step is to support this uh, effort by NIGMS. And so right now, what we're doing is making uh, accounts available, projects available for the Embry states, the ones highlighted in blue here, and for the training and work first development grantees, which is the list of uh, institutions are on the left. Um, so if you are part of these, these areas, then you can sign up and get access to a NIH provided Google account that will help you run through the, all the materials and tutorials. Can we go to the next one? So what we've done is we're running four cohorts. So basically we're providing cloud credits available to run through all the tutorials and in basically time slots. So the first one is starting in July and it's gonna run for 45 days. And there's enough funds on the accounts to run through all the tutorials um, more than one time. We'll, we'll go into that there. We have basically the cost of to run each module if you run it through straight. Um, so you'll see that um, most of the workflows and tutorials are very reasonable ranging in you know, $3 to $10 a module to run. So you'll have credits to do that and you'll have 45 days to, to basically run whatever it, workflows and modules that interest you. Um, so then the second one's starting up in August, August 15th to the end of September. And then the other one's starting up at the end of September and running through November. Um, so basically what we're, offering or having people work with is the different data science cohort leaders in those different states. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, and really what it's designed to do is to, to express interest and we'll go through the whole process of exactly how you sign up or express interest. And then to use the sandbox 
Um, there are support mechanisms through that where we have our um, basically onboarding emails. There's going to be uh, support through the NIH inbox so you can email us and receive support. Um, but to help you run through all these different modules and make sure that you basically understand how to use the cloud, how to run these relevant scientific workloads for you, and to get some confidence confidence and competence in working in the cloud. And, but this is really designed to be interactive. So we're looking for people to give us feedback. So it was the scientific content, what you really wanted to learn. Um, was it easy to understand? Um, did the videos that we provide with the program, were they helpful and instructful? But basically want to get your feedback on how to make this a better program. And then, you know, really what we're trying to do is to help you then go into your environments, your institutions, and make plans to better util utilize the cloud. Because that's really the entire point of this, is to make uh, cloud adoption easy for the research community and to really spark that adoption. So basically the steps are, is that you're going to sign up or contact your data science core leader or the training uh, and workforce development uh, point of contact. And we have a whole list of those in the next slide. So you can look at which one would, is uh, your personal one, and you're going to basically express interest in, in particularly which cohort you'd like to sign up for. And then they're going to provide those names to us, and then we're going to send you an email that will start the, the process of you getting set up on those uh, accounts. So those emails will come from cloudlab at nih.gov. And what we're going to do is we're going to send you a link to fill out a form, and, and that's really important because uh, that's going to take you through logging into the NIH system using your research emails address. And you know, there's been a lot of work so that we can make these accounts available to external resources, but it's all triggered by syncing your research uh, emails with the NIH environment and then starting the provisioning process based on that. And then basically once the accounts are provisioned, we're, you're gonna get uh, emails uh, about the onboarding. So they'll give you very explicit instructions of how to log into your account, um, how to get started, how to pull up the resources, how to link to the GitHub repositories. And we're also gonna send you a series of emails that will help you through the process. So basically, um, how do you operate in the cloud, some of the basic constructs, tips and tricks to how to use the cloud effectively. So you know, you'll be receiving those over the 45 days and they're really designed to help you move forward in running these, these workflows. Next slide. And yeah, and, oh, here's the email. So yeah, so basically, you know, they're going to come out and they're going to cover a, a number of different uh, areas. So one, you know, part of what Cloud Lab is designed to do is help you understand the costs. Like, okay, if you want to do research in the cloud and you have a workflow, what is the cost for one sample? And if I want to run 10,000 samples, then this would be the expected cost for running that research. And that's probably the grant amount that I need to get awarded for me to conduct that research. So part of the issue is understanding billing, how you navigate the console. And you know what we've seen is that there are so many re resources available in the cloud um, that it's really helpful to have like, you know this is step one to get started. So we really help you dig into the relevant parts of the console and get moving forward on that. Then again, you know as we said, to how to access the GitHub repos, to clone them into the managed Jupyter Notebook environments so you can get right into it and a lot of different uh, contact. And as we said, we'll be sending out surveys as part of that. And if you do need support, again, you use the cloud lab at nih.gov uh, email address. Next slide. Thank you, Thad and Lakshmi. We'll reserve all the questions to the end. Now we'll have uh, doctors uh, Babu Gouda and Jordan Rawley to pre to demo their uh, module, but uh, ATEC analysis, and they are from uh, University of Nebraska Medical Center and supported by the Nebraska Imbre. Babu. Thank you, Meng. Um, let me share my slides here. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes. Presentation mode. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Um, the cloud 
ATAC module that I'm going to present um, can be used both for uh, bulk attack seek analysis as well as single cell attack seek analysis. The uh, first, I'll talk a uh, little bit about the module development uh, and the contents, and then uh, followed by that, Dr. Rowley will give a live demo of uh, the module. Uh, this is a team effort. Uh, there are a lot of people involved at the UNMC, uh, Google Cloud team, and NAGMS, and special thanks to the funding by NAGMS. So the rationale for this module development uh, stems from the need to maintain expensive infrastructure uh, at, at the institutional level, um, and it was well covered by the previous talks. And uh, the cloud-based solution um, democratizes access to such resources for everyone, um, and you can have the data, the tools, every, everything at one place, and it's easy to uh, navigate through the cumbersome process of uh, uh, high-throughput data analysis. Uh, so the goal of this project is to build a cloud-based learning module, a self-learning module, where you can analyze attack seek as well as single cell attack seek data and make the tool accessible to the research community. So this module contains step-by-step -step walkthrough of various tasks involved in analyzing the data, uh, a tutorial video showing um, how you can um, use or get hands-on experience by using downsized data sets. Uh, we also incorporated flashcards and then short quizzes for enhanced learning. Uh, and all the um, module was implemented using Jupyter notebooks. Um, and we also use GPU based um, Rapids A package for single cell uh, attack seek analysis. So, what is attack seek? Um, it's, uh, it's an essay, um, uh, essay for uh, transposon. Um, transpose is uh, accessible chromatin uh, using sequencing. It's a very popular technique to study chromatin accessibility um, in different conditions. So the technique uses isolated nuclei um, and then uh, they're exposed to uh, TN5 transposes. Uh, the TN5 transposes dimers um, bind to all the openly accessible chromatin region that are not bound by um, nucleosomes or other transcription factors. And then they, may, they fragment, they make cuts in the DNA just proximal to the binding sites. And then they add, um, the, the technique uses um, PCR handles and barcodes that can be used for amplifying those segments very specifically that are accessible. And then using those raw reads, we can uh, map them to the, the reference genome where you can, where you see these binding of these reads uh, can give these uh, ATAC seek peaks. Wherever you see a peak, that is the openly accessible chromatin um, in this technique. So using these uh, peaks, you can uh, study a lot of different things like different developmental stages, uh, how genes are regulated, how transcription um, happens. And in this particular example, you can see the promoter region is accessible in both cell type X and Y but the enhanced region is accessible only in the X, not in the Y. So based on that, you can you know, identify uh, different uh, gene regulations, conditions, and you can also do the motif uh, identification uh, based on the sequences in the, those regions. So this is uh, the pipeline, the workflow we use for bulk attack seek analysis, um, starts with the FASTQ files and then ends with motif footprinting, um, downstream analysis, peak identification. Um, so all of these steps are nicely packaged into three lessons, uh, one, two, and three, where in the first lesson, you can look at the pre-processing of the data and quality control aspects, followed by the visualization, uh, peak detection, and after that, you do peak annotation to, to exactly under, understand the gene regulation. And uh, in the live demo, uh, it's going to be very clear how to how these modules work. And a single cell attack seek analysis workflow, uh, pretty much, you know, the downstream, the downstream part is very similar to the bulk analysis, but in the, in the front end, um, the single cell data will be clustered into different clusters based on the similarity of the chromatin accessibility. And then we do the downstream analysis at, the, at each cluster level, whereas in case of bulk analysis, we do the entire analysis set as one cluster. So that's the main difference. 
So the single cell ATAC seq analysis has uh, three tutorials um, and it's uh, again, uh, setting up the environment and pre-processing and QC uh, followed by downstream analysis similar to the bulk analysis. The, I mean, if you look at the, the, the times when you need to do bulk analysis versus single cell analysis, uh, the bulk analysis essentially gives the average values of the heterogeneity in the, in the sample. Whereas for a single cell, you can specifically identify the cell types, specific cell types that are responding to different diseases, drug conditions, and things like that. Um, it's uh, it's not so recommended for uh, studies involving mixed cell population. And if you have a mixed cell population, single cell is highly recommended. And uh, bioinformatically, it's uh, it, it also more complex uh, because it has to do with a cluster level peak analysis, and it's also more expensive for doing single, uh, single cell compared to bulk. So we have uh, used uh, the programming environment uh, as in described before, it's the Google Cloud Platform. And we, uh, for the single cell, we use a uh, rapid CA package um, that works on GPU servers as against CPU servers for uh, bulk analysis. We implemented everything in Python language and on Jupyter notebooks. And for quizzes and flashcards, we use uh, JSON files. Um, this, this is the standard software components used for the pipeline that include uh, mapping tools um, and uh, QC and also post mapping downstream analysis for identification of um, um, uh, task with factor binding sites and uh, uh, annotation of uh, differential uh, peak calling. So with that, I will hand over the podium to uh, Dr. Rowley, who can do the live demonstration. Dr. Rowley. Okay, uh, thank you, Babu. Uh, so it's my pleasure to do, do this live demonstration using an example data set to highlight the functionality and the interactivity of, of these modules. Um, so specifically, we're going to be demonstrating the ATAC-seq module to, uh, on an example data set uh, that investigates uh, accessibility changes after depletion of the BAF chromatin remodeling complex. And so, in this demonstration, we'll be asking the question, which transcription factor binding sites does BAF alter chromatin accessibility? And so we can use a taxi to answer this question by profiling accessibility uh, in wild type and BAF mutant uh, cells. And so uh, this, the data for this uh, demonstration uh, is in NHEK cells um, with that control and BAF depleted cells. And it comes from this publication here. Um, so to get started, uh, Lakshmi introduced uh, the NIGMS uh, GitHub page uh, for, the, for the NIH sandbox. And so this, this has instructions for how to set up your, um, how to access Google Cloud and how to set up your computational requirements uh, to, to run each of these different modules. So I will transition to the demonstration here. So this is the Google Cloud console. And anytime that uh, when, you, when you're first starting, this is the first page that you'll see after going through that, that GitHub, uh, the GitHub instruction page. And so you can start up a, a new machine uh, by coming to the Vertex AI workbench and clicking on new, I'll click on new notebook, and then I'll start up a Python 3 type of machine because this module as in the instructions is running on Python 3. And so all the instructions for starting up that, that one, I'm not going to start up a, a new one uh, because I've already started one here for this demonstration. Okay, so coming to the module itself, uh, once we start up this uh, computational environment, you'll see uh, the ATAC-seq module one. This is the first lesson uh, as uh, others have mentioned there are three lessons in this module. Uh, we'll start with, I'm, I'm going to do this demonstration as if I'm processing the data myself. I'll start with lesson one and I can see an overview of that lesson plan and the different steps within each lesson that we'll be performing. And so that includes taking and downloading the example data set, which we've, uh, in, in the interest of uh, the user's time, this example data set has been downsampled and specifically prepared uh, for a single chromosome uh, so that the, the processes work quickly, but that you can still get um, uh, the analysis uh, performed on this example one. 
um, we'll go through quality control, trimming, alignment, and deduplication in this lesson and before moving on to lesson two and three. I will say that each of these lessons are uh, build off of each other, but they can also be taken independently from each other in that at the start of every lesson, you, we have uh, tools to set up the environment and download the example data set. Um, however, they're also done in conjunction where the, the, you can uh, go through each lesson and the outputs from lesson one will be the inputs for lesson two as well. Okay, so I, I, when I'm coming through this module, uh, I can see uh, the overview and purpose section is to uh, come to understand how a tax seek works, gives a brief uh, introduction for it. It also introduces the example data set and provides um, some information on the required files and how to set up the environment. So if you're, this is run in Jupyter Notebook. If you're not familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, how you would run uh, each uh, section of the notebook is by clicking on the on the cell and then clicking run at the top here. So we can we can do this on uh, some cells are comment cells that have images and um, uh, information for learning how to process. And we try to provide information for every single step on the rationale why and how how to run the actual commands that will be run. So I'm going to come here and I'm, I can run each of these cells by clicking the run button here, and that'll take me to the next step in the, in the pipeline. So this first step I, I can see is how to set up the environment. This step we, we can run and it'll automatically uh, configure my environment to uh, import all the packages necessary to perform the analysis in lesson one. Uh, and we can go up and click run. I've already run this cell, so I'm not going to run it again here. The next step is to set up the file system. This includes uh, making directories uh, and copying over data so that we have all the example data sets there. Okay. Once, we, once I do that, I can see uh, this next cell is to check to make sure the file is copied correctly, and it says I should see four files. So if I run that, I can see the four files. So we have uh, steps along the way to check that make sure to make sure that the, the running is, is happening correctly. Okay. So starting out with uh, the quality control, we can again run each of these cells in order. Uh, we come to we I come to this section here that says display flashcards. So if I run the cell, what I can see is this flashcard introducing the fast queue format. So sequences uh, come in uh, when you perform a taxi and you sequence them on, uh, on Illumina, they come in this fast queue format. And so uh, if I want to know more about what each line in this fast queue format represents, I can click on this and have this interactivity to come to, um, to know that the first line is the name of the read, and then we show the sequence and the quality of base within the fast queue format. So we try, I, there are several interactive portions of the module to facilitate learning. Um, and so I'm going to keep going down to continue in this lesson and see that the, the first step uh, here uh, in this quality control is to run fast QC. It tells us how that command is going to be run. And it also outputs a table with some statistics on, on the quality of, of each uh, file, fast Q file that we had uh, downloaded for this example data set. So this shows the quality of, of the sequences we also have this interactive, if I run this cell here, I can see an interactive report of the quality results. Uh, and you can come here to, if you want to know more about, uh, potentially there is a flag for overrepresented sequences, we can come and click on that and we can be directly uh, and immediately taken to uh, the overrepresented sequences that are present within this sample. Okay. Uh, as soon as we're done uh, looking at the quality of the sequences that we uh, that I've uh, I've gotten here, uh, we can uh, learn more about how to clean up these sequences through retrimming. And we introduce why retrimming is important, uh, particularly in a taxic analysis. And and if I continue on and I read about that, I can then take a quiz to uh, check my understanding of uh, how uh, the special considerations for a tax seek. Um, and so if I 
get it incorrect. There's inform I can see there's information provided on, on why that's incorrect. Um, and so I can click through each of these answers until getting the correct answer and have that information for, for to facilitate my learning here. Okay, so um, after we've uh, I've learned about how why it's important to perform that trimming, I can move on to do the actual trimming command and run these run these cells to trim our FASTQ files and perform that that trimming step. And there's comments in each of these cells to introduce um, how that trimming is working and the the direct options in the command um, to explain that command structure a bit more. Okay, uh, continuing on um, this in this module, I can see it's going to be creating a table of the trimming results as well, um, as well as we can generate a plot of the read sizes after trimming. And so these modules are, are designed to provide some graphical representation and interactivity for, for the results of, of each step as well. So in this graph, I can see that uh, trimming the reads in this file, um, most of the reads are still at, at, at the 50 base pair uh, length, but there were several reads that were trimmed down to, to shorter um, fragments. Okay, in step three, we're going. I'm going to be doing mapping, um, and so it introduces uh, the concept of mapping, the concept of genome indexes, uh, provides those indexes uh, for the user, uh, um, but also teaches uh, it teaches me how to create that index if if necessary, and then uh, it provides. Uh, I can see the these commands to actually perform the mapping to an alignment to the genome. And, and the output of that is uh, the um, overall alignment rate, which down below we can check with this flashcard to make sure that um, if you're using the example data set, the mapping rates are matching between um, what is expected and what is observed. Okay, and then we get an introduction to the SAM format. I can see there's a, another quiz down here. Uh, we go into the removal of PCR duplicates, taking a quiz, providing the rationale uh, why we remove PCR duplicates, um, and then performing the actual command to, to remove PCR duplicates. And then we provide a, a table of the quality report after dupli duplicate removal. So all of these tables uh, can be directly integrated into, into results and, and potential publications afterwards uh, to show the quality of the, of the data. And then at the end of each lesson, we provide a, uh, there's a, I can see there's a link to the next lesson. I've already opened that lesson up, so I'm going to transition directly. And we can I can see this lesson here is for the visualization and peak detection. Um, again, we start with the setup of I start with the setup of the environment and the um, the uh, import of the of the data. I'm going to skip down in the sake of time to show you some of the visualizations that we're doing within this, this lesson. Um, in here, once we have the data prepared and we provide the steps to prepare the data for uh, visualization inside a genome browser, and that genome browser is directly embedded in this lesson, uh, and is uh, this is real data that we're able to, uh, by running the above commands, able to see the, su the um, summary of the signal at each genomic position. And so in this genome browser, we're able to browse through the data that, that I have processed up to this point in the lesson. So if you're using your own data sets in this or the example data sets, you're seeing this live uh, update of the, the results of your previous commands. And we can see there's peaks and valleys uh, of, the, of the signal. Uh, and we demonstrate, I can see there's this demonstration of how to change aspects of the visualization to say, uh, change the track color, change the data scale, um, to change these, to make figure ready images and of the results of, of the data if you want to show a locus specificity of the signal. Okay, we, I can see after visualizing and browsing the, the data through the genome, um, I can see uh, there's a section on how to create average profiles of that signal. And right now I'm, I, this, this is creating an average profile around the TSS of genes. 
uh, which is an important uh, check of uh, a tax seek signal. And it provides this, this image of the average profile in the control and the average profile in the mute. Okay, the, uh, um, again, there's interactive quizzes uh, that I'm seeing in this lesson. Uh, we have a short section on insert sizes because with the TaxSeq, if we do paired end uh, a TaxSeq um, analysis, we can, I can uh, learn about how that, that the insert sizes can be informative for uh, transcription factor versus nucleosome occupancy. And we provide, uh, I can see there's this section on plotting the average insert sizes along the, uh, within your data set. And we, uh, there's a section down below on how to separate out the signal by insert size to get separately the transcription factor accessibility versus the nucleosome occupancy. And then the next step is to do peak detection down here. And I can see how this peak detection is going to work. Uh, and then uh, down below, we have another visualization. Uh, I can browse directly the peaks that were identified by the software and how that corresponds to the signal. You can see this; these three sections were called as peaks corresponding to the signal in the control and in the, in the mutant as well. So now we move to the downstream analysis of this, uh, and this is for doing differential peak identification. Peak identification with we have a, a control and we have a mutant, and we want to find differences between those. To use that data to go further and annotate those peaks to genome genomic regions, and to do gene ontology analysis. Uh, motif detection and footprinting. So this, this lesson will provide a lot of results uh, and visualizations that can be directly incorporated into, into uh, potential publications. Okay, so the first step to do differential peak identification, again, we have quizzes. I'm gonna skip over those and for the sake of time uh, and to go into the, the visualization of the results. All of these steps can be run to generate um, the annotation of differential peaks to uh, genomic features. For example, in, in this example data set, I can see that my differential peaks are primarily located near the five prime end of genes in the, in the five prime UTR or in the promoter of those genes. And that's an enrichment above what would be expected by random chance. We can, I can also get a list um, or see the top uh, closest genes uh, and output um, uh, a text file uh, with the, the peak location, uh, the peak score, and the near, nearest gene to that, that differential peak. Uh, in the next section, we go and go push that even further to do gene ontology analysis of those genes that have nearby peaks, and we can plot uh, the um, the results of that gene ontology analysis in this interactive um, uh, set where we can click on different types of gene ontologies, such as biological process, and see those uh, terms that are specifically associated with those genes. Um, so the last thing I'll do is talk about this motif footprinting to say, because we, we're looking at accessibility and we can, uh, we can look at transcription factor, putative transcription factor binding sites to see how our control versus our mutant uh, impacts uh, this transcription factor accessibility. Uh, we can use this uh, software where we can generate this interactive report of differential accessibility between our control and our mutant to say, these are the, uh, if we hover over these dots, or if we don't hover over these dots, we can see green uh, dots are ones where the accessibility is higher in the control, where red dots are where the accessibility is higher in the mutant. And we can hover over each dot to see the motif that corresponds uh, uh, to a specific transcription factors recognition site. So we can uh, identify specific uh, transcription factor binding sites where the accessibility is altered between our two uh, conditions. So this provides an interactive report that we explain how to use down below, uh, and we can integrate that report to, directly into those publications again. Okay, and the other thing that we can do is we can take very specific transcription factors. If we want to compare the accessibility, this is a transcription factor motif footprint to show how the accessibility directly at the transcription factor 
binding motif is impacted in, in, the, in the mutant versus the control and do that overlay comparison to show that the accessibility, it's more accessible in the control than say in the mutant. Okay, and the last thing is um, a table. So if we want to find all those uh, transcription factor binding sites that were differentially accessible at a certain significant score, we, uh, I can see that I can output a table of those differential, uh, differentially accessible motifs. So in the end, uh, what we're provided are several results uh, from this module. Um, and we can make conclusions from this example data set. I, I, I can show that BAF impacts accessibility by showing the signal and the differential peaks at individual loci using that genome browser view that these differential uh, sites impacted by BAF are near the five prime end of genes, that um, BAF controls accessibility of many different transcription factor binding sites, including TP63, which was uh, included in the results of the original publication of the data, and that BAF contr controls the access directly controls the accessibility of that TP63 site using this differential motif footprinting uh, visualization. So at the end of the, the lessons, uh, I would recommend that you come and you can I can show you that you can uh, turn off the machine just by clicking next to the machine's name and clicking stop on the machine. And that way you'll, you won't uh, incur any further expenses. We aim for these example data sets, the, they'll cost around $4 uh, to run the, the entire lesson um, on, the, on these three lessons. Um, so yeah. Uh, with that, I will turn the, I'll stop sharing and I'll turn the time back over uh, for, for further discussion. Thank you, Jordan and Babu. And our last demo is by Dr. Chris Hemi. He is from uh, University of Rhode Island, supported by the Embry of Rhode Island. And his module is um, Biomarker Discovery. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Chris Hemme. I'm the director of the Rhode Island InBray Molecular Informatics Corps. And today I'll be demoing our module, the cloud-based learning module for biomarker discovery. Some quick acknowledgments. Dr. Bumsup Cho is our program director from Rhode Island InBray. The data set that we use in this module was donated by Dr. Nisan Gonam and her laboratory from the College of Pharmacy at the University of Rhode Island. And we thank them very much for that. And we'd like to thank our Google and Deloitte team for helping us build this module and deploy it on TCP. Most people watching today are probably familiar on some level with the concept of biomarkers. But what we often see is that bioinformaticians and clinicians view biomarkers from very different perspectives. So with my background in environmental microbiology, I tended to take a more bird's eye view, a systems level view of the data, whereas clinicians have to really think about the practical aspects of biomarkers. Are they sensitive? Are they specific? What are the utilitarian aspects? Is it cheap? Is it easy to test? Is it a quick turnaround? Is it easy to interpret for both the patient and the clinician? These are things that the bioinformatician may not naturally think about. So one of the rationales for developing this module was to provide the basic vocabulary for analyzing biomedical biomarkers so that bioinformaticians and the clinicians can communicate better and are better able to translate the results they get into practical clinical applications. And again, this is a very basic module. The field of biomarker discovery and analysis is very broad. We wanted to build this module to complement some of the other Sandbox modules, which also deal with some aspect of biomarker discovery, such as the proteomics and the transcriptomics, the attack seek that you just saw, the multiomics. The case study that we are working with is the renal ischemia reperfusion injury model, IRI. This is a critical problem in organ transplantation. It results from both 
the loss of oxygen when an organ is removed from a donor, as well as oxidative stress when the, the, when the organ is reconnected to the new host. And there are a variety of effects that we see up to and including organ failure. Right now, there's no approved pharmaceutical treatment for IRI, but several potential treatments exist. And this is a really good system for studying biomarkers for a couple of reasons. First is that there are several well-known and well-studied serum biomarkers for liver injury. And we also have a proteomics data set that we can not only analyze, but compare to these classic biomarkers. Our module is a set of nine Jupyter notebooks, all using R. And we have five core submodules, introduction to biomarkers, introduction to the IRA case study, an introduction to the use of linear and logistic regression for comparing quantitative biomarkers, exploratory analysis of proteomics data, and finally, differential analysis of proteomics data. For users who are new to the some of these methods and who need more background information, we have some additional optional submodules, such as introduction to R data structures, introduction to linear models, principles of exploratory analysis. And then we follow up the end with a submodule that introduces basic concepts in machine learning, which are increasingly being used in biomarker discovery. That I will switch to the demonstration. You saw with Jordan's talk, this is the same setup that he was using. It's Jupyter Notebooks, so I won't go into the background of that. But I will go through the five basic submodules to just briefly demonstrate. Chris, if you can speak closer to the microphone, it will be better. Our first submodule is just an introduction to the concept of biomarkers. We define the biomarkers very broadly. It's simply some biological entity that indicates a change of state. So we go through some of the properties that we're looking for in biomarkers. We talk about some broad categories, whether it's qualitative, quantitative, macro scale, quantitative molecular scale, which we use the common blood test, which most people are familiar with if they've ever gone to a doctor. And finally, omics data sets. We look at some more technical definitions of biomarkers, such as the best glossary used by the FDA. We talk about some of the additional issues you have to think about once you have identified a biomarker. And then we briefly discuss five case studies based around different types of biomarkers. So a protein biomarker an enzymatic activity biomarker, a genetic variant biomarker, a metabolic biomarker, and a pathogenic biomarker. And just as with Jordan's module, we have inline quizzes for each of these submodules that users can use to test their knowledge. Now, at that point, users can only either go to some of the Background submodules, if they need that information, we'll skip ahead to the IRI case study. As I mentioned previously, there are several good serum biomarkers for detecting not only the existence of kidney disease or kidney injury, but the progression. So serum creatinine and blood urea nitrogen. These are well-studied and well-understood biomarkers. So if your doctor sees that a serum creatinine concentration is greater than one milligram per deciliter, that's an indication that there might be some kidney disease. Now, if you have ever watched a medical show, you've probably seen an episode where a medical helicopter lands at the hospital, a doctor jumps out with an igloo cooler and rushes to the emergency room. What they're doing is they are trying to transport an organ as quickly as possible to avoid organ failure. The first level of damage comes when you remove the organ and the organ is no longer exposed to oxygenated blood. You see 
elevated serum biomarkers, you see inflammation, cellular stores of ATP drop causing damage to mitochondria. And eventually this could lead to cell death or total organ failure. But when you reconnect, that causes an additional damage because the oxygenated blood is now producing reactive oxygen species, which can't be effectively removed because of the damage to the mitochondria. So this can lead to more inflammation and further cell death. So it's vital that the organ is transplanted as quickly as possible. Right now, there is no approved medical treatment for IRI, but several laboratories are looking at drugs which have been approved, which can be repurposed for this problem. And the drug that Dr. Gonum's lab is looking at is troprostanil, which goes by the brand name of remodulin. It's a prostacyclin analog. It's stable at room temperature. It has a long elimination half-life compared to other analogs. And so what they were looking at in rats were four sample groups, a control group, a sham group, which is just surgical treatment without IRI, a placebo group, which was the IRI damage, and then a sample group that was pretreated with troprostanil before inducing the IRI damage. And the hypothesis is that the pretreatment will cause the biomarker profiles of the treated group to more closely approximate that of the control and sham groups. In other words, it will mitigate some of the IRI damage. So for the programming component, the first thing that we do is we build an experimental object in R. There are many ways to do this. Bioconductor has a summarized experiment object that's optimized for Owens data. For this module, we're just using a simple R list. It's a little bit easier for new users, especially to see what is in this object and why we are packaging all this information together in one place. So this will include our serum biomarker data, our proteomics data, and our metadata. And we are going to filter our proteomics data to remove any protein in which more than 80% of these samples are missing data. So this shows how to build that function in R. Then we run it and log transform the data. And now we are going to save this object so that we can load it in the next submodules. So now we'll go to the linear regression. The linear regression part is Going, we're going to compare serum creatinine and blood urea nitrogen, but it's really a setup for understanding how to do the differential analysis in the next session. For the logistic regression, this is widely used in clinical biomarker work. The full scope of using logistic regression is beyond the scope of this module, so we're just going to introduce the basic concepts so that when users go into the literature and they see these more sophisticated methodologies, they'll understand the basic vocabulary and will hopefully have an easier time learning what the more complicated methods are doing. Right, so first we will load our object. We're going to combine our serum biomarker data with our metadata. We'll start by making a simple scatter plot of serum creatinine versus blood urea nitrogen. And we can see what appears to be a nice linear relationship. Our groups are mostly separating. And consistent with our hypothesis, we do see not only a difference between the treated and the placebo state, but the treated on some level seems to be regressing back to the sham state or the control state, which is what we would hope to see. Now, this data set does have some outliers, and there's a biological rationale for eliminating these outliers. Some of these samples, severe necrosis set in, and so they are beyond treatment. There's really no reason to keep them, so we will cut some of those biomarkers out and redo our scatter plot with our 
global regression, regression line. But of course, we want to break this down into the effects based on the different groups. We show the users how to use box plots to compare the means and the distributions of our different groups. We will run the regression. This is with the outliers in place. It shows how some of these outliers are affecting our results. So we can see the effects on the QQ plot, on our different residual plots. So this uh, this further validation that we need to get rid of these outliers, which when we do that, we get much better regression plots. And the earlier module on linear models goes into these plots in more detail for those who aren't familiar with how to read them. And then when we run our regression, then we can see what the different effects are within these individual groups. So, for example, we see that for one unit increase in serum creatinine, there's a 83 unit increase for blood urea and nitrogen in the placebo group. And we can start drawing conclusions from that data. Now for logistic regression, again, there are many different ways that this is used in biomarker research. We are going to use a very simple binary model where we are going to apply a serum creatinine cutoff of one milli one, one microgram, one milligram per deciliter. I'm sorry, I got my units confused. But we're going to classify our data into those two states, healthy or disease, based upon that cutoff. And then we're going to use logistic regression to see if the blood urea nitrogen concentrations can be used to segregate between those two states. So we create a dummy variable based on that information. And this is what our curve will look like. And we can already see that there's not going to be perfect separation between the two groups. And when we run our regression, we see that there is a odds increase uh, in being able to distinguish between the two, but it's not, it's not huge, but it is statistically significant. And then we show how to use a receiver operating characteristic curve to evaluate how good that segregation is. We're looking for a curve on the left side of the diagonal. The closer to one, the better. So 0.87 is not bad, it could be better, but there is some ability to separate our samples based on our different biomarkers. So that is what we're trying to show here. And we, with the Jupyter Notebook, you can put your own models in and test different classification schemes just to see what the various effects are. Now, in the exploratory analysis, we're going to primarily focus on principal components analysis and heat maps. We'll first load our data. And we will normalize it. So we'll start by looking at our box plot for our unnormalized data. We'll use quantile normalization. And we can see that our data is normalized now. So now we can start doing our PCA and start getting some indication of the type of separation between our groups and what proteins might be driving this. So initially in our first PCA, we see that there does seem to be some significant separation, maybe based on time. But one thing about this data is that there is a batch effect in place. And if we color it by the batches, we can see that that's what's driving this initial separation. So this gives us an opportunity to show users how to do a batch correction. And initially for the PCA, we'll just use Lima's remove batch effect function, but in the differential analysis, we'll incorporate the batch effect into our linear model. So if we remove that, now we can see that the batch effect has disappeared and there is, we're starting to see some more legitimate separation based upon our different factors. 
but proteomics data by nature is fairly noisy. So we're going to focus on only the most 100 highly variable genes. And when we do that, we start seeing more clear separation, especially between our, uh, our sham and control and our treated and placebo groups. And then if we do our loading plot, we can now start to see which proteins are driving the separation. So we see that there are two groups that appear to be correlated with each other. Or we have two groups of correlated genes or proteins that we can start exploring in detail. And we can do something very similar with heat maps. We're using the complex heat map function of Bioconductor, which is very nice for omics data. It allows us to label our axes based upon our different states. Again, we want to look at only the most variable proteins, so we'll look at the top 50. And now we start to see some separation. We have this cluster here that is primarily our control and our sham state, and seeing that most of our injured states over here. That will go into the differential analysis. We're using Lima for this. There are many packages for doing differential analysis, but Lima is kind of the grandfather package. It works for just about any omics data set you could think of. In fact, many of the more specialized packages are actually built on top of Lima if you work in R. So if you understand Lima, then you can understand pretty much any other package you might ultimately work with. So we'll load our proteome. And we need to account for the time factor in our model because the amount of time that the kidney is clamped off experiencing isochemia is very relevant. So we're going to take our treatment and time covariates and combine them together into one covariate just to make the model a little bit simpler. I'm going to, in the interest of time, jump down to that model. So we will use the standard Lima protocol to run our linear regression. So this is our model matrix. Here we account for our batch effect. We do our fit. And we're setting up contrast. So this will allow us to do pairwise comparison based upon the entire model as opposed to doing multiple t-tests like you might be inclined to do. And we'll just focus on the six-hour comparisons. So here is our contrast data. And we can bring up interactive MA plots and volcano plots. You can click on individual data points and find the specific data at the bottom of the plot. We can do the same thing for our volcano plots. And so from this, we can identify the different proteins that are up or down regulated under different conditions. And this is where we end with this module. But the follow-up to this was Dr. Gonham's laboratory took their proteomic results, did a pathway analysis, and did some experimental validation with Western blots. And what they found was that in the placebo samples, that is the IRI samples compared to the sham, they saw a decrease in pathways related to oxidative stress protection and mitochondrial dysfunction protection. But many of those pathways were recovered in the propostanil treated samples, which is what we were hoping to see based on our hypothesis. And in this module, we end by discussing some different directions you could go in with that, either pathway analysis, meta-analysis, multi-omics, single cell spatial genomics and so forth. And then if we had time, we could go into the machine learning module where we introduce very basic 
machine learning concepts and how they could be applied to biomarker discovery. That is my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you very much. And we are actually a few minutes ahead of the schedule. Uh, we will use the rest of the time for uh, Q&A. Uh, there are a number of uh, questions in the Q&A box. Uh, many of them have been uh, answered. But uh, as I promised earlier, we'll still address it so that everybody can actually hear it, have the uh, benefit of uh, the panelists uh, to add additional explanations if appropriate. So let me go through the questions. First of all, there are a number of questions regarding the availability of the recording and the slides. And let me just to make it clear to all of you again, um, the slides will be available to all of you. Um, so is the recording. The recording will be uh, posted on our website as well. Okay. Uh, therefore, all the links, all the other uh, specific informations uh, on the slides or recording, uh, uh, you will be able to copy that from uh, those sources. The first um, question touched on different point is I'm going to read it out. Why not make this available to all investigators? Not just NIGMS grantees, right? That's a good question. Uh, let me explain. By the presentation we had, you can see that uh, they are made available to all investigators. As long as you have a GCP account, either from your institution or from, from by yourself, you have access, you can use that. The NIGM supported grant, the grantees are selected for this NIH sponsored account at this point as part of the development process to testing out this experiment, this uh, exploratory uh, new approach. So we want to make it work. We want to make it uh, continue to improve through this process. And going forward after that phase, what happens? There are several possibilities or options, right? Let's say it's very useful, and I already saw very, some very positive feedbacks here, then uh, it may become an essential um, infrastructure capacity everybody appreciates, then NIH can get more resources such as uh, Nick's initial answer uh, uh, implied that could make this available to everybody. And uh, the other option is that uh, then users, being investigators or students, you pay the minimal cloud computing fee. As uh, Thad already mentioned a, a couple of times, we designed these modules in a specific way so that it's sort of nimble and practical, not bogged down by uh, too big a load of, uh, uh, let's say, data carriage. Therefore, the, the, the cost is uh, manageable at this point. For a skilled user, uh, each mod some modules can be run on $1. So that's another option. And along the line, I would say that um, the, the, the attendant questioned for other investigators, right? Um, I would say it is reasonable to use your research grant for this, I think, if it is support your research, support your uh, training of your student. All right, so uh, I hope this covers this question. It's a great question. Uh, we, as I mentioned up front, our intent is to make this available to as many people as possible. I would extend from what you mentioned here, 
to all investigators. Actually, we want to go beyond all investigators, all students, all others who are interested. So therefore, uh, a financial management model is an important consideration in this process, in this project. So that is a long-term viable and sustainable. All right, thank you. So Ming, uh, they want to see the POCs. I think the Nick and yeah, others. I, I will, I'll, I'll get there, okay? Um, the next question, the, the GitHub uh, link that is available. Can the modules run a local com a computer cluster? Uh, Nick, you want to elaborate this a little bit more on this? Sure, happy to. Hi, everyone. Um, so yes, you can run uh, many of the modules in uh, other environments, including local computing clusters. Uh, they are essentially run through uh, Jupyter notebook environments. Many clusters have uh, that set up and available to them. There are two caveats. One is um, yeah, it won't necessarily natively work with a job scheduler associated with your local cluster, uh, such as Slurm or SGE uh, that you may use. So there may need to be some coordination with your uh, local cluster staff to be able to uh, get that script for submission set up if you need help there. Uh, and secondly, some of the modules use cloud native solutions that are only available, for example, in GCP. Uh, so if it's using the native um, healthcare API or something that's only part of the GCP environment, those won't work automatically uh, in your local environment, but there may be things that you can uh, do to swap out or bring in um, you know, some of those components uh, to make them work in the local environment. Uh, but lastly, as Ming said, it costs you know uh, very little, a dollar, a couple of dollars. Um, and there are ways to make sure we can get people signed up and on the lists uh, for the modules. Uh, and you'll be hearing soon about a broader access to the whole Cloud Lab uh, environment that was referenced uh, that may be another opportunity for you in the coming months as well. Thank you. Dr. Lee. There's... Uh, it's Chris. Yes, Chris. I also have a version of my module that works in Google Collab. It's not as functional as the GCP version, but it is available Yeah, People can't work on GCP. Okay, that's good to know. And as I mentioned that uh, Nick and his team is, is working to make this, uh, can be provided through uh, AW, uh, um, AWS as well as Azure. So the next question, well, this is whether the uh, video tutorials are uh, is going to be available. The answer is a yes. Um, the next question is, how do I find out who my NIGMS sandbox point of contact is? All right. Um, as um, thought showed on the um, on his presentation, if you are from one of the embrace, in other words, if you're a student or investigator from one of the idea states, you are covered. You should be able to contact your Embry PI or every Embry has a data science core. Contact the data science core director. If you ask how to find them, if you don't know, then every state Embry has a website find them out and contact them. And we we specific encourage you to contact them through their you know email uh, so that you build that connection and and join this group. And uh, if obviously if you are from the six programs listed on the uh, the the training programs, contact the PIs and they will get you through the process as well, okay? The cost, what is the estimate cost for running through all training modules? And we talked about that is very manageable, a few dollars on each, each uh, uh, module, but the caviar, as I mentioned, it depends on your uh, skill level, right? So, but, as the part of the testing, 
as I mentioned, we allocated enough resources uh, for a user, either student or investigator, during the 45 days to have ample time to uh, uh, learn through the learn the process. Next question: What will be the maximum space given to conduct analysis? Nick, I see how you had an answer. You want to um, comment again? Sure. Um, yeah. So space is a uh, you could could be meant. So I'm not sure if, if the uh, request was about disk size or, or uh, storage space in, in buckets uh, on the cloud, uh, but that's one of the benefits of cloud. You can scale um, you know, pretty much um, uh, you know, fully, uh, uh, indefinitely, uh, but that will come with a cost. So just be aware that you can uh, run much larger data sets and, and expand using cloud resources, uh, but I would recommend doing it with a smaller set first to get that benchmark that was discussed earlier uh, that Thad mentioned, and then you, know, you can get a sense as to how much more it might cost uh, to do it on larger data sets and many more you know, samples or experiments of data. Okay, next question. Um, is there a set of list of Python extensions or can we use additional extension that we may need? Nick, you're still there? Still here, yep. Um, so that's the beauty of these modules. Um, so they're in GitHub. You can fork the code. You can bring them into uh, the um, Vertex AI and Jupyter Notebook environments, make modifications, add in additional libraries and uh, extensions uh, to your heart's content. So these are meant to be a starting point um, and something that you can use to um, you know, kind of uh, practice with. But from there, bring in your own data, make adjustments to uh, some of the components by adding additional um, you know, algorithms and, and uh, processing steps in. Um, yeah, that's what really this is meant to do. And, and you can even uh, bring those back in um, to the broader module environment. If you're familiar with GitHub and the way that pull requests and, and other things work, uh, there can be additions uh, to this uh, growing library of tutorials uh, over time. All right. I would I would just add one caveat that the cloud lab is not for PII or PHI. So all this is a, a training tool, um, but it's not designed for any sort of secure information. Good point, uh, uh, I thought. Next question, can you run those modules with your own data sets? So let's give Nick a break or ask Jordan to answer this question. Absolutely. Um, so that's that's how it's designed. So uh, you can uh, we start with the FASTQ files, and so you can upload your FASTQ files, and we provide uh, on the GitHub page provide information on how to do that to start with your with your own data set, and then process as, as you go through. Um, and so this is designed in mind for as a learning environment using the example one, but we designed it also in mind of users actually wanting to analyze their own data. And so there's this um, modular structure so that you can you can do so. And um, to comment on that, and the last question as well. So in the setup environment, we also provide information on, and uh, hyperlinks actually to the packages that, that you'll use so that you can see how to download and install those packages if you want to also use this in um, uh, local clusters or anything like that. So we tried to provide as much uh, functionality and um, modularity to, to these uh, lessons as possible. That's a great, great point, Jordan. Is it, So as Thad mentioned, the modules, the, the main focus of the modules are for training, for learning. But if you want to supplement to have additional capacity you can use it linked to your uh, uh, local clusters for your, let's say, high-powered data processing research, right? So Jordan, stay on the next is for you as well. It's about eight. Can the um, ATAC uh, seek analysis pipeline be used for chick seek as well? I yes, mostly. Uh, I was. I will say uh, a lot of the processing steps in ATAC seek and chip seek are very similar. Um, but I, I will say there may be some necessary adjustments to consider 
the the differences between the chip seek and attack seek. But you can use the, for example, the, the trimming read quality, the peak detection, uh, differential peak identification. All of those will be similar. The differences will come in in the motif footprinting. Those things that are more specific to attack seek. But the nice thing about these is, like I said, they're they're modular and they're designed as a launching pad for 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 um, you know modification and, and usability. So that if there are specific uh, people interested in doing a tax seek, they can use these as a template and modify them accordingly to do that chip seek um, type of analysis. Okay, thank you. Next question, is there specific instructions on uh, scalability when running those modules with large number of data sets? Does GCP handle scalability automatically? So this is related and let's get uh, thought to address that. Yeah, so um, using the Vertex AI platform, which is uh, basically a platform designed for you know the largest scale AI programs out there. So it's what you, Google uses to run a lot of its in-house in, in AI. Um, it is very scalable. So when you configure your notebook environments, uh, you can pick the uh, size of the VM that's driving that, which can be very small VMs, but to very, very large multi-CPU or multi-GPU um, processors. And, or you can use some of the managed services um, that allow you to, you know, basically use the full leverage of, you know, some of the, the Google behind the, the hood uh, ability to bring up compute power. So there's a lot of different ways. There's also HPC capabilities within Google Cloud. So there's a lot of ways that you can get the compute resources to even process very, very large data sets. Okay, great. The next one is specifically for Jordan. Okay, you ready, Jordan? Dr. Raleigh, flashcards and other clever notebook functions built for teaching. Refreshing to see what an educator can do with this format. Excellent. Yeah. Any comment, Jordan? Uh, I, I appreciate <laughs> the comment. Um, yeah, Great. I'm proud of it. And I, our, I'll just reiterate um, that our goal is to have inter as much interactivity and with these lessons as possible. Um, and that was how we created this with that in mind as, as coming from a, the standpoint of education um, and teaching people not only how to process the data, but why they're doing each step in that pipeline analysis. Okay, next question. Can students receive certificate after completing training modules? As thought answered, uh, the answer is no, is no for now, uh, but it's something we can look into. And um, as, as we mentioned earlier, at this stage, we really want to make this functional and practical and useful uh, uh, for student and investigators. Uh, other features can be considered in the future. Next question, how do we register for training sessions? Um, this is from Gus, actually Gus is an uh, Embry PI. I don't know, Gus, you mean uh, is, uh, register for training the, the the fundamental training I mentioned in my presentation or for the module specifically. Uh, if it is for the module, as I mentioned, you can log on the module. There are extensive tutorial materials there, and uh, the module the 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 platform we are offering also have the on demand uh, training uh, capacity, so you can request that. If you are referring the former, then you should have received multiple calls from us to sign on for those uh, training sessions. And we, as I mentioned, we conducted six, 60 sessions so far. And going forward, uh, there uh, more can be scheduled. All right. Good. Uh, next one is about the list of contact again. The list of contact, as I said, when the, will be, is on the slides and the, will be on our website. 
is going to be for everybody to um, to see. But as of now, as I mentioned, if you belong to any one of the 30 programs, the best way is to contact the PI or the data science core director. And I believe uh, the next question, I don't know. Okay, well, this is the end of the question on the- There are some open questions, so you can see this. A few open questions, I think mostly from Gus. I can't hear you. There are some open questions, mostly from Gus. Where is the open question? Uh, okay, answer. Okay, open question. Yes. Interesting to register several people for the Cloud Lab cohort. Oh, Gus, you're the right person. You're the Imbri PI. We are counting on you to uh, register. Great. These modules are great and they, they will be very useful to bioinformaticians and graduate students. There is a need for introductory teaching modules for undergrad students such as principal of statistic genomics. Is NIH planning on to provide such content for undergraduate students for the IDEA network? As I mentioned, this is a uh, our first step, we are offering this as first version, and it is an open pla platform. We would very much to see um, additional module built by um, investigators and uh, uh, faculty members, and uh, that process, we can have um, discussions how to implement that. We have several ideas. But uh, the, an the short answer is a yes. And uh, we welcome your input or volunteer to, to uh, uh, develop modules. All right. Can cost budgeted onto current IDEA grants? Right now, if you're from IDEA State, there's no cost. So we'll discuss your question later. If we are listed, as PI of NIGMS grant and not associated to IDEA uh, Embry, whom should we contact? Um, so if you're NIGMS grant, if you are not from IDEA state, um, at this point, I hope you belong to one of the six um, um, training grants that are uh, are listed, selected for participation at this point. Otherwise, um, we would in, still encourage you to use it. Uh, as we mentioned, the cost will be very minimal. We encourage you to use it uh, through your institutional GCP account. And um, this is all, I want to add this. This is also a great point, a great uh, opportunity to ask um, your institution to have a GCP account if they don't have. Our experience in deal, dealing with uh, um, investigator is that initially their institution don't see the reason or the incentive to have account. And after uh, the work we have done together, their institutions readily agree to sign on. Once you, once you sign on, there, there are multiple avenues, right? You, you, your institution um, may be willing to foot the bill and uh, you can also contact your NIGMS program officer for your grant to say, uh, to ask if this is um, payable through the grant, but I'm not speaking for them. Uh, you should check with them, okay? Hope this answers your question. Next one. This is from one of our lead developer for one of the modules. Uh, will it be possible for us to update them as they learn more uh, an improvement? Yes, the answer is yes. This is a great question. 
uh, the answer is very similar to what I mentioned that um, this is an open platform. Uh, we anticipate new development, development of new modules as well as update uh, improvement of current modules. That again um, can come in different forms. You can work on the current one or for some significant development on an existing concept that might take a new module. So those are, uh, we're open to those ideas. All right, next one. If interested participants are not currently at the Imbri Associated State, can they still sign up? So I believe I answered this question. Um, next question. Uh, where can I find information about creating my own module? Um, stay tuned uh, or contact us and we can have uh, discussions because in the past, we have a, a, no, a nosy, in other words, notice of specific interest that that's how we founded those 10 um, uh, invest, investigator teams to develop those 10 modules. Um, we may have another one uh, in the future. Okay, got suggested we have presentation at the regional meeting. Yes, we did for the ones that, that already hold. Uh, for the future ones, happy to do it. Okay, we still have five minutes left on the clock. Uh, if uh, you have more questions, type in. Okay. Looks like there's another question that just came in, Ming, from Kyle. Yeah, yeah Update go ahead. Submitted as pull requests on GitHub. Um, that's a good question. I think that's the best approach for now. Uh, we will review the pull requests and see if it makes sense to integrate into the core module. There may be some engagement with you um, to create a separate module uh, that's based off of that as a template. But I think the easiest way is use the GitHub functionality. Uh, so pull requests as well as the issues list if you're familiar with github uh, to you know kind of engage directly with the team and ask questions about um you know technical questions or questions about how you could fork and, and update the repositories just elaborate on that a little bit more uh behind the scene um all the development each module there were, there were uh, uh, extensive work uh, on quality control adaptability because there is, you know, the module sitting on the GitHub uh, uh, depository, especially in, in the current experiment migrate uh, uh, through the cloud lab, uh, NIH has to conduct that uh, checking and uh, uh, quality control to make sure they are compatible and deliverable and deployable. So um, uh, this kind of uh, improvement all need to go through a similar process to make sure they are functional. So, okay, if there's no more question, uh, you all have a great day. I hope you enjoyed today's webinar um, and uh, sign up your investigator and student to try it. Thank you, have a great day.